Gordon B. Hinckley, who said, they're very ordinary men, but called to an extraordinary office. We admire and we honor the apostles and prophets, but they're pointing towards Christ. That's what they're doing. That's their calling. And the Holy Ghost will witness to you when they, when they say stuff like that. I think it's their ordinariness with the Lord's Spirit, and they, they work miracles. I still think you're extraordinary men. Welcome back to For All The Saints podcast. And I, I have Brian with me today, also known on uh, Twitter or X or whatever you call it these days as Acts of the Apostles is the username. And uh, Brian, you do amazing work. In fact, I like to claim that I was one of the early followers of your account. I was it's one true. of the originals back when you started. Um, yeah. And I followed it religiously ever since. And I, I'm just boasting about myself here. Really. But um, to glorify your account, I it is the only account that has made me revisit Twitter, albeit on Safari. I deleted the app because I was wasting time. Yeah. But uh, I come back to, to visit yours. Um, I well, just, no, no, uh, thank you for coming on the show. It's it's long overdue. And I suppose an opening thought-provoking question might be, I had Justin Briley on the show, and he talks often about how the story of Jesus Christ is the greatest story ever told, and it's why it's lasted, and because it's true as well. Yeah. Um, stories are important to you, and you share the stories of the apostles, modern day apostles, and they seem to resonate. Yeah. What do you think is the, the impact of stories on our faith? Well, I think uh, that's an excellent question. And if you go back to the Bible, you know, to our earliest written sto uh, books, it's amazing stories. I mean, stories that will still just catch you short, you know, the original, uh, you know, Abraham, and his stories with his family, and then Isaac and Jacob, I mean, Genesis, the stories in there are still, uh, they still move you, you know, thousands of years later. And I actually have a theory that uh, Heavenly Father loves stories. And that's why he puts his servants through good stories. And um, looking through church history, there's too many stories to remember so they're all falling through the cracks because we only have so much brain uh we only have you know so much that we can we can hold on to and remember and so if you go looking for stories in the church history you're gonna just gonna find nuggets that you had never heard before so why why stories of modern day apostles for you to to sort of take this uh, upon yourself, this uh, role of of sharing these specific ones. So I was I was called as a bishop about eight years ago, and I was given the gift of Henry B. Eyring's book, his biography written by his son, and it was such a help as a bishop because a lot of it was really how Henry B. Eyring learned to hear the spirit and act on the spirit. So it's almost, I considered it almost like a manual. And so I, read, I will lead you along. Is that, that that's one? the one. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm in the middle of reading that one now on my Kindle. Isn't it something? Isn't that a great book? It's very interesting. I, I'm still on the uh, early stages. I, I He hasn't been called as a general authority yet. So I'm still yeah. kind of early married days in it but it is oh, fascinating oh it's a good book and some of the stuff he learned as a as a bishop there in stanford um was super super helpful and then there's one story later on that uh that i used for like ward council and stuff it's it's uh how he described how the apostles uh did councils and spoke together that's how i tried to get our ward council to go and that's what i taught them was that story uh from there and there were so many good stories in that book. And uh, I just realized that uh, probably every other apostle has amazing stories as well because they're in the Lord's service. And so um, I read a few other biographies. The Bruce R. McConkie one taught by his, or written by his son has some great stories in it. And um, so I just decided, I was like, oh, I wanna know about each and every one. So yeah, I'm gonna do all 103. That's brilliant. Uh, and uh, 
people not following should. Uh, <laughs> it's it's just it lights up your feed, and and there are some interesting ones as well. Interesting in many ways. Um, yeah. But for those listening who might not be so familiar, we do have some friends of other faiths who listen. What is the function of an apostle as we know it? And would you say that that function has slightly changed since the original uh, apostles? I Okay, so the function, uh, to take your first question um, first, the function of the apostle is the exact same as it was in the uh, primitive church at Christ's time. You would send them out two by two. And they were to, you know, talk of Christ and preach of Christ and share the good news. And right now, that's the exact same thing. When Joseph Smith uh, called 12 apostles, they were, uh, their main responsibility was to go out and, and uh, share the good news. And they did, like, really quickly. After they were called, they went over to Great Britain and just had amazing success, amazing success. And so right now the 12 apostles that we currently have nothing much has changed except that it's a much more global church and so they're going to be going all over the world and uh preaching preaching christ i've got a friend who lives in saudi arabia and he's lived there for like the last 10 years and for a long time there jeffrey r holland was the apostle that was in charge of the middle east and he said he actually saw jeffrey r holland way more than he ever saw apostles in Utah when he lived there. Like he'd see him twice a year there in Saudi Arabia. And so, yeah, they're all over the world and they're they're uh, meeting with government leaders and saints all over the world. And so their stories are kind of exciting. They're almost travel narratives, you know what I mean? Like, like I don't know, I'm trying to think of some of my favorite travel books, like a Bill Bryson book or like uh, Three Men and a Dog or something like that. They're, they're just having adventures all over the world. Yes, yeah, it's it's true. It, interesting, we were we were just visited by Elder Garrett W. Gong, one of the more recently called apostles, and uh, that was a fantastic experience. I, I got to, I was asked to cover it for the church newsroom. Uh, what was that? So I got to, oh, it, it was uh, it was a brilliant experience. It was a couple of weeks ago, and and the articles up on on the church whatever it is the you know they have, they have a lot of different news ones but uh that was a, an amazing experience and i think the first time in 25 years that an apostle has um spoken to all of the young adults in the north of england but i mean like you say we it's a mirac- uh, it's miraculous really that we get to see so much of them in the uk even though it's I've done that flight. It's it's a harsh jet lag transition oh, yeah. from America to the UK, but they yeah. get here and and we see them around very often, you know. Yeah, there is, and, and and I I imagine Garrett W. Gong loves coming to the UK because didn't he go to Oxford or Cambridge? Wasn't he? Uh, he he went there for college, right? Or he lived there a long time. I th- I think so, and I know his wife. Her ancestry is very much embedded in in. Uh, Ireland and the Midlands, I believe. Oh, very um, cool. That's my understanding. Yeah. But um, I, I'd like to get your thoughts on the, we've heard it thrown around, especially by Sister Sherry Dew, who um, in her book, uh, Insights into a Prophet's Life of President yeah. Nelson, she spoke about when she was, I can't remember the specifics, but she was reflecting on how extraordinary the apostles were. And I think it may have been, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, who said, they're very ordinary men, but called to an extraordinary office. Yes. Um, and Sherry was kind of taken aback, and she argued that, no, no, you're being humble, but these are, I still think you're extraordinary men. How do you respond to that? So, uh, yes, I, and I think that was in that was in her most recent book, right? Prophets See Around Corners, which I love. Yes, I yes that was great. That book. And so I think she's right. And I think Gordon B. Hinckley's right, actually. I think they're both right. Um, uh, but I think uh, this is this is my theory: is that I think the Lord is is teaching his apostles and prophets his whole life. You read their whole stories, like their biographies, and they'll have amazing stories from when they were uh, teenagers and when they were in college and young married, uh, with young families. But they're um, they're ordinary in the sense that you hear stories, they're going through the same things that we did. 
you know what I mean, as either parents or uh, in high school and stuff. And a lot of the stories I share aren't even necessarily spiritual. They're just either funny or they're tragic or they just teach you something about the human condition. And so I think she's right. They are absolutely extraordinary, but you read about them and you're like, what? Well, you know what I mean? They're, they're absolutely, it's like, okay, yeah, no, they went exactly through, through what we are going through. You know what I mean? They struggled as young parents. They had to make decisions. And so they're, oh, they're great to read about, but it's the same. We talked about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, you read those. And one of the reasons they get your heart is because they're going through the same sorts of things that we're going through. They're wondering, all right, we got this promise from Heavenly Father. When's it going to happen? You know what I mean? It's, it's, we're getting old and we don't have kids or, or whatever. And so, yeah, you see that with the apostles and prophets. What are, following on from that, what are some of the common traits you've seen in apostles from the many biographies you've read and, and uh, reflecting on their stories? Yeah. So, so, a lot of it is listening to the spirit and following it is the, is what you see through all of them. Like at a, some of them from a very young age, some of them, not, not so much, but some of them from a, a very, very young age. And so a lot of it, and maybe that's what Gordon B. Hinckley means about the ordinary is it's not them themselves. They're, they're extraordinary. Although some of them you read about, like you read about Russell M. Nelson and you're like, Oh my good night nurse from a little, you know what I mean? When he was a little kid, he was excelling at everything. Um, but mo for most of them, it's, I think it's their ordinariness with the Lord's spirit and they, they work miracles. They work absolute miracles. And so I think that is the one thing that goes across all of them uh, because they're all very, very different and come from different backgrounds and different interests, but the following the spirit, I'd say. That's a good question. What are some? Uh, I'm going to test you on your memory and recall. Sure, of, absolutely. Do you have Do you have examples? Uh, because I think the, as you said, stories are so important. So if I can challenge you to, to recall some of the stories today, that would be brilliant. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So some of my favorite stories are things that could happen to your local bishop or elders quorum president or young young men's leader, like there was a mission president in Scotland and uh, David B. Hate, that's who it was. Sorry about that. So he left, um, he was like mayor of Palo Alto or something like, and he was like, had this really, he was just great businessman. Everybody loved him, absolutely loved him. And he was called to be a mission president in Scotland. And there was a new member that was making the doors for one of the uh like the mission home or something he was doing something and fixing it and he loved his pipe he absolutely loved his pipe so he was smoking his pipe and working on the door and david b hate came up to him and was like hey can i speak to you in the other room for a second and he was just like oh crud i've gotten caught and oh man am i gonna get kicked out of this brand new church i was in and so he goes in there and he said hey i'd like you to give a talk at a release society meeting we're having in a couple of weeks and that shocked the new member. He'd never given a talk, never done anything like that. And he was like, well, I don't know that I have anything to say. And, and he was like, no, you'd do great. David B. Haight was like, you would do great. And he said, um, he said, he realized he wasn't going to get out of it. And he said, well, what do you want me to speak about? And he goes, could you speak about the word of wisdom? And he goes, and so the guy was like, well, I'm going to speak about the word of wisdom. I better give you this. So he gives David B. Haight the um pipe and david b Haight goes if um if you ever need this it's going to be in my desk and it'll be waiting for you which is such a tender sweet thing to say you know what i mean he goes it'll be here waiting for you and i appreciate what you've just given up and the guy did give the talk never went back to the pipe and he wrote about it you know several you know 10 years later just a charming account of what it was but uh, it's the stories like that of just just that love you get when you feel the spirit. You know, he was he, he was inspired when he did it just the perfect way of not making him feel bad about smoking, but saying the right things to help him uh, stop smoking. And I don't know, that was a good story we heard just recently. That's a great story. I don't know much about Elder Hate. He was 
just before my time. I was born in in 98. And I think that may have been the year or maybe early 2000s that yeah, I, I'm not sure, but um, he, was, he was very old, and I think those last few years when you were so like you guys did overlap for a little bit, um, uh, but yeah, you wouldn't remember him. But man, he was well loved at the time because he just he was very conversationable, and he was just a he was just a sweetheart of a man. He was a sweetheart mm -hmm. of a man. You you mentioned earlier miracles as well, and yeah. um, often when you when you speak to other Christian, you know, our Christian cousins of other den denominations. Yeah. Uh, and you discuss the the gift or uh, it's interesting, actually, when they refer to uh, apostles as gifts, you know, mm -hmm. God's continuous gift to humanity. Um, yeah. But uh, one thing they always say is, well, apostles, one of the way you um, come to learn someone is an apostle is by their fruit, you know, their works, by performing yeah. miracles. Signs shall follow those. Uh, so I wonder if, um, have you seen or had, had your faith strengthened that miracles still occur today in yeah. our time through studying the lives of apostles? Absolutely. Um, there's some, there's like a through line from the early days of the church in, in upstate New York to today that there are miracles that are absolutely still happening. And some of them, it's really interesting because I don't think the apostles talk a lot about the miracles that happen. Sometimes you'll hear about them from like family members will, will talk about them or, um, you know, like, like, uh, uh, Lorenzo Snow seeing the savior. We actually don't know about that from Lorenzo Snow. We know about that from his niece, uh, who he told and showed the spot and from records of the 12 apostles. He told the 12 apostles, but he himself, I, I'm 90% I'm sure I'm right about this. Never once, never once talked about it. Um, but there's a wonderful story, a wonderful story about M. Russell Ballard that happened, you know, within living memory, for sure. I was, I was alive at the time. He was, um, the church had a fast for Ethiopia. And um, the church had a fast in, for Ethiopia. And they, they uh, raised a bunch of money to go over, but they didn't have any contact with anybody in Ethiopia at the time. So they sent M. Russell Ballard and Glenn Pace, was it? Somebody else, a 70 over with him. And um, a couple of miracles happened in this. Have you heard this story before? I, I actually, I interviewed the biographer of Elder Ballard when a few days after he passed away. And, You're right. Uh, I listened I remember, to I, I related so I, I tried to share this story, but I got it mixed up with about three others. So yes. I'm actually not clear on the specific story. Well, let me tell it again. And I won't tell it as good as the biographer. And man, that biographer killed it. That is such a good book. That book is that that book is so powerful. Um, That's an amazing one. But one of the the first ones is they learned that there was a member in the country and they had no idea where it was. They had no idea where he was. And M. Russell Ballard was like, we need to find this member. He's all alone and he may need help. He may need anything. So they get off and they're like, they have no idea how to find him. So they just, they start asking around at the airport. Hey, do you know any member with this name? And they're like, oh yeah, he works here. And so they found him immediately. And um, they asked him if they could have a, uh, they asked him if they could have sacrament meeting at his home the next day. And he just, he hadn't had the sacrament in six months. He just, his eyes welled up with tears. And so they had the sacrament, uh, and then, uh, the next day, and then Russell Ballard said, well, we're here under the direction of a prophet. They were the 70 at the time. And they said, why can't we just pray that there will be rain? And they hadn't had rain for like a year or two. It was like a huge amount. And so, uh, M. Russell Ballard gave a prayer. You look outside and it was just, you know, just like it had been for a year, year and a half. That afternoon, um, a small cloud was seen in the horizon. And then all of a sudden it rained like crazy that afternoon. And uh, everywhere he went around the country, the rain would follow him. And uh, so I like that because it's a small miracle finding that guy right away. I think the Lord does do those coincidental miracles where it's the Lord's behind it. And then like a 
big one. I mean, that's almost a biblical miracle right there. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting because there is this, um, you see a paradox and I feel like I should meme this into existence yeah. by giving it a, a, a clever intellectual name, the apostolic paradox or something like that. Um, but you get these men who are not people who would naturally show their arms before you, you know, announce right. these experiences yet at the same time, uh, they are having these experiences, uh, constantly on their ministry that, um, that are just so powerful and, and miraculous. And, yeah. you know, we, we find examples of them and I'm sure, you know, similar to what they said of the savior in the new Testament of, we couldn't even write a hundredth of the things that we've yeah. seen, but suffice it to say, uh, and that feels the same. I mean, I, I reflect on several personal experiences, some of which are incredibly sacred that I just, yeah. I wouldn't be able to share on, on this because it wasn't with me. It was, it was a friend, but, incredibly sacred experiences with apostles and uh elder quentin l cooks uh, um was came to visit the mtc the missionary training center while i was uh, training there and he he gave a devotional and i always remember the first feeling i had in my life where i'd always followed the apostles but it became an active vibrant faith of these men are really called of god yes. was he testified at the end and he said you, when you have sacred experiences, you know, you should record them for yourself, but don't be liberal in sharing those. However, yeah. as an apostle, I feel it in these times with missionaries, especially that I should be more open about those experiences. And then he, he began, to, he began to bore powerful testimony, saying the words, I know his face, and I've heard his voice. Um, and just bore one of the most powerful testimonies of the savior that i've ever heard not because of his eloquence or his yeah. public speaking but the spirit that carried it it was yeah. incredible that um, awesome yeah. yeah the holy ghost will testify and like we 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 admire and we honor the apostles and prophets but they're pointing towards christ that's what they're doing that's their calling and the holy ghost will witness to you when they when they say stuff like that it's it's an interesting question actually because they are prophets, seers, and revelators. And I, I don't know. Could you share some experiences, perhaps, that you've read about of prophecy and revelation with apostles? You know, uh, yeah, do, have you encountered yeah. themes like that? Uh, yeah, my wife just whispered something to me. What was that, Melissa? Did you have one you that came? about the rain in Canada? Don't remember that one. About when he <laughs> Canada and he told him, "This is going to happen. You need to oh. sell everything you can and put in as much weed as you can." Yes. Okay, that is a good one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so, I think that was John W. Taylor, the son of John Taylor, and um, they were just starting up the um, the stuff in, up in Canada, and. That might have not been. Maybe it was somebody else. There, there's so many stories. Oh, it could have been Rudger Clausen. Um, but they, uh, there was a, there, there was a uh, famine there, and people are getting really, really nervous about it. And he drought. says, or a drought. Yeah, there was a drought. People are getting very nervous. He says, "Do not worry. Uh, put in as much as you can." Sell as all your influence, sell anything you can, put everything into the top. Yeah, I'm only sort of remembering the story. Um, but uh, the crops ended up coming. The crops ended up coming. Who was that? That was, oh, I'm so sorry about that story. It was a good one, but I'm only no, giving you listen, a half. Listen, so the crops grew, uh -huh. and the, um, the crops grew. Would your wife want to come on camera and join? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's a. Uh, so the crops grew and I, and um, the, it was still dry. There was no rain. And so they were about, they were to the point where they there needed to be rain. And they went from the point where the farmers were like, okay, this really needs to happen to utter despair. We've just lost everything. All, all our land, everything. We've just lost everything because we put everything into this wheat and it's, it's done for. And um, 
then it rained and it rained more than they had ever thought. And it rained just the right amount so that they had bumper crops. It was like, it was the most 40, Canada had ever done something bushels to the acre. It was insane. And they made so much profit and it was at the time of the war too. So they were able to sell extra over to help all the people who were starving. And so it was, it, it was, it was insane. The amount it was like, it's, I, that's a you good need to story. Find the book. You need to find the yeah, book. Yeah, that's a good story. And I'm so sorry that I don't remember who that was. My the way I determine whether we're going to share a story is if I want to interrupt my wife, whatever she's doing, to tell the story. If I'm like, oh, you got to hear this one. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. No, that's that's fantastic. But but as we've shared, we've already shared a a couple experiences there of. Um, of prophecy and revelation in the spirit of revelation and, and yeah. the Holy Spirit too, which I suppose is, that is it, isn't it? Um, another theme that seems to come up is the apostles' experiences of, of suffering or, or tragedy in their lives. Yes. And yeah. what, what can you speak to this and why do you think that that might be an important sort of, ingredient in in the preparation for an apostle of the lord yeah so a lot of times it, it's tempting to think of them because you see them up there and they're they just look happy because they are happy they've got the spirit and you're like well it's easy for them you know what i mean to follow christ but then you read their stories and a lot of them a lot of them have like childhood tragic events like david b hate or uh is is one of them like his dad was like mayor of the town bishop and just passed over when he was eight years old and a lot of a lot of um the apostles will have an experience like that when they were younger and i think it's because this is my guess this is my guess why it happens so much is the lord i think in psalms it says the lord is the god of the of the fatherless and the widow and I think he's training his apostles to also be very, very, uh, very, very tender and um, solicitous of the of the fatherless and the widow. I think that's the reason. But it happens a lot. A lot of them have been through that experience. There's a on a very different note of suffering to that. Uh -huh. There was a crazy experience that you shared from Rodger Clausen. Oh, yeah on his mission could you do you remember that enough to share it yeah there's a couple there's two that you might be thinking of um one of them was he was just a new brand new missionary and um and the ku klux klan hated the uh missionaries and the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints at that time and so they were always like they're always trying to burn down their houses and get people out and um, stuff. And so he was down in the South for two, like two weeks, two or three weeks. And his companion and him were walking along and like a, a mob came up and got him all like seven guys and we're taking them. We're, we're just like, you're coming with us. And um, normally what they do is uh, like, this has happened to other missionaries. They would take like a willow switch or something and just beat them bloody with it holding them down and that was probably what was going to happen and the older companion went to get one of their guns and another one shot him in the head and um and they all just turned to rudger clausen because they knew i mean that's still murder even you know what i mean even at the time in the south and so uh rudger clausen just looked at them and just shouted shoot like that and then one of the guys in the mob was like, put your guns down, everybody, put your guns. And then he was like, well, are you going to let me go get a doctor? Um, and it was a really tense moment. And they did, you know, the mob didn't know what to have, what uh, they, you know, they didn't want to go to jail for what they did. And so there was this real danger, you know, if, if cooler heads hadn't prevailed, they would have killed him right there. But one of them was like, all right, go quick, get a doctor. And so they did. And, um, and he was able to he was able to to take the body home back to to uh, Salt Lake City. But it was uh, Joseph Standing was the was the missionary who was killed. And you can still see there's a monument there it's somewhere in Georgia. I can't remember where in Georgia, but somewhere there's a there's a monument. When I told that story, like a bunch of people were like, oh, I've been there. And they would show me pictures. 
of them being there. But yeah, Rudger Clausen was a real, um, like that was a brave, like he really handled that well. And it's just a sad story. You know what I mean? It's not, there's no miracle there except that he just, it was grace under pressure. And um, yeah. Is that the one you met or when he went to prison? Are you thinking of that one? Well, it was, it was that one that I meant, but oh, yeah, he, okay. was in, he was in prison with Lorenzo Snow. Was, yeah. he, was he present for that Love Hosanna him. shout? Yeah. And he, so he became like Lorenzo Snow's protege kind of. And um, he became a state conference, a president right after prison. Lorenzo Snow called him to it. And when Lorenzo Snow was up there in Brigham city, like they raised a child from the dead, uh, Lorenzo Snow did. And he was there and got to see that. So he was really tutored by Lorenzo Snow. It was really one of those things. Like nobody wants to go to prison, but I don't know that Lorenzo Snow would have ever met him except they were both in prison. And then Rudyard, Rudger Clausen, you know, became a an apostle for like 40 years or something, president of the 12. And so it was one of those things where the Lord just makes everything work for the best. It's quite incredible. I feel like there should be a, a movie made about that. Oh, that would be, good. <laughs> that would be such a good movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I wondered if you could teach us a bit moving on to a, a current period of time um, yeah. about the current first presidency um oh, yeah. russell m nelson dallin h oaks and and uh henry b eyring perhaps yeah. some insights you've learned about them that strengthens your faith uh, in them absolutely yeah they were they were at, they are absolutely inspired men and they're men who follow the spirit of the lord they absolutely are if you read their biographies if, when you listen to their talks and their experiences they absolutely there's wonderful and i actually don't remember any i haven't done i've only done henry b Iring. i haven't done dallin h oaks or russell nelson yet but uh russell m nelson did a has these wonderful stories and i can't wait to go back and dive into them about being assigned to eastern europe right after communism fell um and just getting it set up with all of the and the miracles that happened there um but uh so yeah all all three of them they're really really good at that i was just reading a story today that that uh elder bednar tells about dallin h oaks and dallin h oaks is a brilliant man he could have very well been uh, some people think that he was definitely on the short list for being on the Supreme Court before he was called to be an apostle. But he's very well respected all over the country as a judge and um, as a lawyer and as a uh, as a, a professor at law school, very, very well respected. And um, uh, David A. Bednar was talking about how there was this meeting where he felt very strongly about something, uh, President, President Oaks did. And somebody who was just new to the quorum had an idea and said it and you could tell kind of that's another thing is there's always funny stories about people coming into the 12 and being very nervous about you know uh, and being very intimidated um but he said his piece and um president oak said you know what i have not considered it in the way that this brother has considered it I think we should table it, or I think we should do exactly what he said. Um, so there's no like, there's no personal aggrandizement or ego at all um, with that. They are looking to learn what the Lord wants them to do, and it can come from anywhere. And Henry B. Iring, later on in the book, you're gonna, this is my favorite part. He talked about the first time he saw a quorum of the 12. He wasn't in the quorum, he was like president of Ricks or something. And he saw the 12 apostles like speak forthrightly, like he had never seen in business before. He was a business professor. He studied how they make decisions. Everybody, he said, everybody's normally very careful and doesn't want to offend the boss here. Like they let it fly. Everybody just said exactly. And he said, how are they ever going to agree? All these strong men who are disagreeing uh, vehemently and respectfully, but vehemently. And he said, a miracle happened. And just as they were talking, they all started to line up in an agreement and the spirit was there. And right when he was like, Oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like that happen. Um, 
Harold B. Lee said uh, before they made a decision, he goes, you know what? I sense that somebody has not, is not uh, had a chance to say what it, what it is, or somebody's still unsettled. Let's table this to the next meeting. And um, one of the brethren, as they pass over, Harold, uh, Henry B. Ironing heard him say, thank you. There was something I wanted to say or look up or something. And um, that's, that's the story I told about earlier that I tried to do with my ward council, where everybody just feels like they can just say whatever it is and disagree with anybody. But what we're looking to do is we're listening for the spirit and we're trying to get everything to, to go to the uh, spirit. And so, and that works at a ward council. I found that that works. So I know that that sort of stuff, because I learned it from Henry B. Eyring. I know that stuff's happening in Salt Lake with the, with the councils, you know, in the church office building. And so mm-hmm. I guess that's what I've learned about them is it's what the Lord wants is most important for them. And there's really no ego. And if there's anybody that deserves to have ego, man, it's Russell and Nelson, man. That guy's impressive, but he doesn't have it. He just doesn't, he doesn't have it. So. Who has most surprised you out of all of the apostles that you've studied? Okay. There's a couple, um, a couple, there's two that have most surprised me. James, James E. Talmadge had so many good stories that I was surprised I hadn't heard any of them. I mean, the stories were so, so good. He's a British apostle. He, I don't know if you know that, but. Oh he, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're very proud of our. <laughs> He's of wonderful. Our British apostles here. You know, well, we're having a. We're having a good happy moment with with the calling of Elder Kieran as well. We're all oh good you know, man, yeah, know. that is yeah, <laughs> what a great man to be called. And so James E. Talmadge, I knew would be impressive because I've read Jesus the Christ and I've re- I've heard a couple of things. Just the caliber of stories were such that I was shocked I'd never heard them. And some of them are just funny, like not even necessarily spiritual, but um, but you learn something from them about human nature. Uh, like he was a bicyclist right when chains on bicycles happened. And uh, he would ride home from the University of Utah to his house. And the only place he would get off was this little, uh, was this little, uh, like little tiny bridge or wood that went across a ditch. And he thought, you know, I'm good enough. I think I can do this. And so he went over and just bit it, just fell into the ditch, all muddy, you know, bruised up. And just the way he was, he's like, all right, I'm not going to stop until I've learned to do this. And so he spent like an hour or two just going across, sliding off it. And uh, when he got home, they thought he'd been in like a fight or like a mob or, you know, something uh, or some kind of riot. Um, But it just shows who he was. You know what I mean? He was like, "Okay, we can I can do this. I'm not going to stop till I do it. Um, And then there's there's several of his stories that make me cry. Um, but another one is John W. Taylor. And this one shocked me because he was one of the ones that was excommunicated for polygamy after the manifesto. Um, right. Yeah. Do you know much about him or do you know anything about him? No, except for his link to the film, The Absent Minded Professor that, that you shared. Yes. Uh, okay. So I'm doing him right now and his stories. Yeah. His son wrote The Absent Minded Professor and Flubber. And so the son of the prophet John Taylor, uh, or the grandson of the prophet John Taylor, son of his son, John W. Taylor, ended up working for Disney and writing uh, Flubber and the Absent-Minded Professor. Um, that is brilliant. Isn't that hilarious? But he, uh, I, if you would have told me that there was an apostle that was, um, that was let out of the quorum and then excommunicated later would become your hero, I never would have believed it. Um, but the stories from his life are phenomenal. Uh, he actually, you talked about like prophecies, like he told the people moving to Canada, he goes, don't worry about business. There'll be a time you can have breakfast up in Canada and have dinner in, in uh, Salt Lake City. And everybody's like, what? Like, that's not even possible. Like, that's not even physically possible. Um, but 45 years later, people would go up to his wife, Nellie, and say, hey, I was there when he said that. And airplanes came after that. And like, it just, the, it all happened. Um But after he was excommunicated and he was very popular and just warm and people loved him and he loved people. And so it was really, really hard for him. He had two opportunities to have what he had as an apostle. A Protestant church said, please, we'll pay you a handsome salary. Come. And he was like, 
he was like, no, I'm not going to do anything against the church. What I can do, uh, you know what I mean? The one thing I can do right now to build up the kingdom is be absolutely silent and make this as easy for people as possible. And then um, some polygamists came and they were like, it's all apostate over there. You come, you be the prophet. And he actually got really furious at him. And he said, everybody that leaves the church says they're at right and the church is not. I will never abandon the church and kick the guy out. And so he had two opportunities to really use what he was so good at. And he didn't do it. He, he didn't do it. And so he's become a real hero of a real hero of mine. Um, and I got to talk to one of his grandsons who was just, or great grandsons, maybe great, great grandsons, but uh, who's active in the church, just got out of a stake presidency. And um, it was really like touching to talk to him because they have a lot of family stories about how he never stopped believing in the church. He never went against the church, always supported the brethren. And, um, and the story, and, and I'm not even going to tell it now because I'll screw it up, and I'm going to be telling it in a few weeks when I finish John W. Taylor. But his, what happens when he dies, it brings me to tears, absolutely brings me to tears. I think if he'd lived longer, he'd be like Matthias Cowley and have come back to church, but he died soon after that. But So that one really surprised me. If you would have told me that, that you would have ended up being like one of my heroes, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have believed it. But man, it's a good book, and it's a fascinating story. So you, you've left us on a cliffhanger so that people can go and follow you uh, on on Twitter and, and follow that story. You yeah. know, that's that's what you were doing with that uh, Rudger Clausen story that you mentioned earlier. I, I was laughing before thinking about it because I remember I was so hooked on that story that I would be waiting almost like people are, who are fans of TV shows or yes. something. I'd be waiting for the next day and refreshing your page thinking, when's he going to post the next <laughs> part of that story? I need to know the ending. Yeah, um, it was such so a long story. It was the only time I ever uh, uh, chopped up a story into several days, but it was a long, long story. And so, yeah, but yeah, it really I know, is I, I suspenseful, <laughs> that story. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Were there any surprises that um, that you thought challenged perhaps um, preconceptions or popular perceptions uh, as you read? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so I remember when I was a missionary, there was another missionary that just said, I don't want to learn too much because I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to handle it. And um, and I thought at the time, I was like, that's not a way to live. You know what I mean? It's it's uh, So at the time I wasn't, uh, but I understand that feeling. Uh, you know what I mean? Because you will find out when you when you study the apostles, they're human. They're definitely human. Um, but I love that, man. I, well, I love that in the Bible. I mean, there's no part of the Bible where anybody is not human. Even the Savior, who is uh, who is divine, is so tender with his friends. You know what I mean? And then all of his friends are definitely human. Like Peter is my favorite. I love the story of Peter. And so when I, when I hear a story or read a story where an apostle is, you know, he's growing up to his calling or he's new and he doesn't, he just doesn't, he's not who he's going to be in 20 years or whatever, or it doesn't bother me. I like it. It gives me hope. You know, I mean, just like the story of Peter gives me a ton of hope. So, um, oh, that, that might not have even been the question. Remind me what your question was again. Well, no, that's it's a good point. We were talking about um, perhaps what what had surprised you that may have you know challenged popular perceptions or, oh. or you know pre preconceptions. But the, your point on um, humanness and and in infallibility in in some respects, um, yeah. I think of Galatians two eleven with with Peter at Antioch, you know, with with Paul yes. and. Right. And they're butting heads. But also, um, you know, I, I interviewed the church historian Spencer McBride uh -huh. and he made an excellent point was with um with how talking about how he loves the messiness of the restoration. Yes. Um and he said we the prophets and apostles learn their calling as we learn our calling. How else yes. do you think they learn that calling? And and I reflected on 
experiences when I've taught Sunday school or, or done things and I've thought, yeah. man, I did a terrible job, but I'll improve or, or so. And, yeah. you know, it reminded me of um, reading Elder Ballard's excellent biography and the story about him investing significantly into the new Cadillac or, or some yes, yeah. similar car, the, the Ford something or other, and uh, it completely flopped. And you think the Edsel. it's uh, it's a great moment when you when you see behind the the conference curtain, you know, of, of the humanity of them. I I love it. I love that part because you still see the Lord's hand in it. The Lord's hand in it because I know I'm I'm with you. And I remember that I remember that interview you did, and that was a that was a profound point. The messiness of the restoration is some of where some of the best lessons are, and you can really see the Lord's hand. Definitely. Um, I had a thought when preparing for this about how the Lord can, I, I hope I can articulate this in the right way. Yeah. What can we learn from the Lord about the direction of his church and what we can take from that, from the apostles that are being called as we look through the different personalities at different times of different needs of the church. I, I see the last three apostles that have been called have all had a very big impact on compassion. And Elder Suarez has written a book on compassion. Elder Gong just released a book about the gentleness of, of the Lord as the shepherd and, and yeah. as us being shepherds and lambs as well. And Elder Kieran, having heard him speak many times in, in England, is a very gentle person. And you look back at people like Elder Legrand Richards and, and things, and <laughs> it's opposite. And I'm wondering, okay, what can I learn about um, the church and the current state of, of the gospel spreading in the world from this? I wonder if you've reflected on that or have seen that need for different personalities in different periods of the church no that's fascinating i mean that's a great that is a great observation and a great um that's a great question and you're absolutely right at different times it seems like there is like in the early utah you had a lot of people that could just go out because that's what he'd do he'd be like all right you orson pratt we're gonna put you through we're gonna send you over to donner pass or whatever and you're gonna live there for a couple of years and so he had people that could do that and they could basically lead the uh, colonies wherever they went. And then in the early 20th century, he had a lot of people that were like, for the very first time, going to uh, Harvard and Johns Hopkins and stuff. He had a bunch of apostles that were also really, really uh, impressive academics. And uh, I hadn't thought that, that um, gentleness and love right now we're seeing a lot of that but we are aren't we and so what that means i don't know except that maybe we are a we are at a time where people just need need that kind of love um i love just yesterday on twitter uh patrick kieran gave just a lovely lovely uh happy ramadan how do you say it oh, i'm sorry ramadan. But, Ramadan, thank you, uh, for our Muslim brothers. And well, I, I just am so proud of our church and so proud of, I mean, just, and I love that he did that. And, um, and you know, he's got a lot of experience in the Middle East. And so I think as somebody that can build bridges and just be a friend to people in these countries, man, he is going to be top notch. But I love seeing that. And I love hearing stuff like that. So that's a very astute point that you had about that. that was very astute. Well, thank you. But <laughs> I actually, uh, I remember thinking it when uh, they announced that Elder Kieran was called and I reflected on the fact that I, th I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong in saying this, but I do believe that this is the first time in church history where we don't have a an apostle with a direct um who is a direct descendant of the Smiths, i.e. Joseph and Hiram. That's, no, that's um, absolutely true. Yeah, because M. Russell Ballard passed away, and there was there was a time, I hope I have this right. Okay, I'm 90% sure I'm right about this. But there was a time where there wasn't a direct descendant, but Bruce R. McConkie was like a son-in-law 
of of uh, somebody and or of uh, of Hiram Smith because he was Joseph Fielding Smith's son-in-law. But yeah, no, it's the first time. It's it's the first time. And even with that, it was a six-month gap between two apostles who who had the direct link, I believe, and that was kind of the tentative link in the middle. I remember reading about that somewhere. Ooh, oh, yeah. So so it's like the first, and I guess you know. I took that and with my nerd brain, I was thinking, well, is there something I can learn about this? And right. having served my mission in, in Asia, I, I was thinking, well, yeah, the, the church is uh, international and yeah. not to say that it, it matters hugely who you're related to, but it just shows that, uh, you know, I've got someone coming on on the show in the next week who wrote the history of the church in Mongolia. And oh, I can't wait to listen to that one. So, you know, it, it just, it's really inspiring to see that growth and, and trying to, trying to learn if, if there is something to be taken away from that, perhaps. Um, I think so. I, I think so. That's another really good point because we are, we are an absolute global church and you hear about what's happening in Africa right now and uh, other parts on the globe. And it's just like, oh man, miracles are happening. It's, it's uh it's just it's it's a great time to be alive and to be in this church it really is as as one of my i have a couple of concluding questions but i wanted to ask you about um who which apostles have the best sense of humor that that you've read about oh who are the who are the most humorous uh that's a that's that's a good question okay so so John W. Taylor, actually, it's very funny, but it's because his son is a funny, is a humorous writer. And so that really comes through. Um, Bruce R. McConkey, people don't know this because he's not humorous um, in his talks. And his friends and family, they'll be like, well, why don't you ever crack a joke? And he'd be like, there's no time for that. We're, we're talking about the gospel. Um, but my dad actually was put into a state presidency by Bruce R. McConkey when I was very, very young. And he said he's the most humorous man he's ever met. He said he's like, I don't know. Do you watch The Chosen? Have you seen The Chosen? I, I have seen it. Yeah, I've watched. I've watched um, definitely the first season. I've watched fully. Okay, so my dad says the way the Savior is in that is exactly how Bruce R. McConkey is was in real life. Oh, like just that really, way. it's exactly what he was like. Like he he had people in stitches, and he just put people at ease, and um. And so I actually have a, I have a, uh, I have a theory that like, there's a certain type of humor that if you have the spirit with you a lot, you'll have because it's gentle and it's looking out for other people. Cause um, we just had uh, Elder Renlund come to our state conference and he was funny that way. He was really, really funny that way, but it was a gentle humor. His wife was the same way. And it was just sort of, it was a generous, it was a generous sense of humor. Um, Dallin H. Oaks is actually somebody that in real life is very, very funny. Um, very, very funny. And you don't quite get that from his talks. You don't get that from his talks. But in real life, yeah, he's really, really funny. So. Right. That, that is interesting to see. It, it, it is funny. Whenever we have an apostle visit, they do always love to crack some jokes. Uh, yes. when uh, In the more informal meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. I had that with Elder Gong, too, who I always thought was very uh, well, he is. He is very philosophical thinking yes. and, and quite soft natured in in his talks. But you know, had a few uh, crackers where when uh, when he was visiting. But uh, so for you, Brian, awesome. in in closing this up, um, two questions really. Um, how has how has studying the lives of apostles blessed your faith and discipleship, and why should other people? Uh, care about uh looking deeper into into these experiences so for my faith and discipleship it has been nothing but a strength to it the you just see the lord's hand um through very human people and it's inspiring and it's it's wonderful my dream actually and I don't even know how I'd go about this, but a lot of these stories I think would be great as tiny cartoons, like three minute cartoons. And, uh, but I don't have any art, you know what I mean? I don't even know how I'd go about doing it. Um, but they're really inspiring. A lot of them are really touching. Some of them are just funny stories. And, um, 
man, they just bring joy. So uh, they're good examples and they're good examples of what to worry about and what not to worry about. And, oh, it's been great. And just learning about all of them, even the ones uh, that had a rough time of it in the beginning of the church and left the church, even hearing their stories have been, have been faith promoting. So anyway, it's been really good. It's been really good. And so with, uh, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to reference the, the other question too, of, of, you know, people thinking, well, we don't worship <laughs> or them or reverence them. It's, uh, it's yeah. a, yeah this and so why why should we care why should about we learn about the stories yeah which is an excellent question um because great stories just feed the soul and these are some of the best stories i've ever i've ever found i mean a lot of times i feel like i'm reading a mark twain novel or i'm reading you know uh, some of them it's like you i feel like i'm reading dostoevsky you, you know what i mean it's it's uh there's just so much richness there. Our our history has so many good stories and just wonderfully fun stories. So yeah, even though we don't worship them and they're pointing their way towards Christ, and that's really what what they do is they direct us towards Christ. Oh man, learning about them directing people towards Christ just brings you closer to Christ. It's I love these men. I love these men. I love these men uh, so much. That's awesome. Uh, final, final, final question. I promise. Sure. No, well, I would love to hear your number one favorite story. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And this is one I haven't told yet. Um, but it's one I absolutely love. I absolutely love this story. It's a Heber J Grant story and, um, I'll be doing Heber J Grant the next go around. I go like, I do an, apo uh, an apostle that's one through 10 and then 11 through 20. And um, he's, he's in the thirties of the apostles. So like, I think he's 33 or something. And so uh, the next go around when I go to the thirties, I'm going to do him. But he, there was a time when the church was in huge trouble and there were several apostles that were on the uh, board of a bank in Ogden and the bank was about to go under and the church it would have been a real black eye with the church and it wasn't even like it wasn't the church's fault what was happening but it just would have dragged them into it would have dragged them into it it was a real crisis point for the church uh heber j grant was a very young apostle at this point it was wilford woodruff was the uh president and at the quorum of the 12 apostle meetings are like we need to raise money and we need to raise it quick and he went to Jesse Knight and Jesse Knight was like, I'll donate money to the church as, as much as I can. Um, and, and everything, but I don't feel good about like with the bank, you know, people made mistakes at the bank and I know the church had nothing to do with it, but, uh, but I'm not ready to do it. You know what I mean? I, I just don't want to do it. And, and Heber J. Grant was like, will you just please pray about it? Just pr please pray about it. That's all I can ask. And he understood that. And he got a call the next day from Jesse Knight. And he said, uh, he said, the next time you ask for $5,000, I'm just going to give you $5,000 because he prayed that night. And he just heard in his head over and over again as an answer to pray to prayer, give $10,000, give $10,000, give $10,000. And, and Jesse Knight in prayer is like, he didn't ask for $10,000. He only asked for $5,000. And he just kept hearing in his head, give $10,000, give $10,000. And so he gave $10,000 um, to Hero J. Grant. And the crisis was averted. And there was a bunch of other people in the church that helped out with that. But but I always remember that. Um, I always remember that uh, uh, the Lord saying, give double, give double. And him, Jesse Knight going, that's not what he asked for, it, which, which makes me laugh. But also teaches me about how the Lord works and generosity and and uh yeah yeah that's in my top 10 i should say i've got about 10 or 15 that i absolutely love but that's one i haven't i haven't shared yet on it but uh uh and i can't wait to do it because the way it was written in the history book just just uh, uh just moved me and made me laugh at the same time and that's my favorite that's the sweet spot 
Well, I, I appreciate you coming on the show today, Brian. It's been long overdue. And if people want to hear more stories, head over to uh, Twitter or X or Elon's World, where, wherever you, whatever you refer to it as, uh, and follow Acts of the Apostles. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Brian. It's been really fun. Oh, this has been fun. Thank you. I love this. I love this. Uh, I love your podcast. You get great. You get great people on. Thank you. Yes, they are great. I, I love each one. They're kind of like children, each episode. <laughs> <laughs>Thanks for watching for all the saints. This show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts, subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.